they talked to her a little bit about, they asked questions like, how do you, like, what do you handle with comments? How do you handle comments on your YouTube videos? The way she put it was, um, you know, sometimes when, when someone would say something negative, she'd just talk to them like she would talk to a grandchild who had no brain. <laughs> Scotch. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 198 of Coffee with Butterscotch, the game dev comedy podcast of Butterscotch Shenanigans. I'm Seth, and I'm the games programmer. I'm Adam, and I'm the bearer of a new tattoo. I'm Sam, and I'm the RT. Yeah, this is a show where we talk about life, business, and working in the games industry. Today is April 8th. 2019. Wow. That was <laughs> weirdly normal. Before we get started, we have a warning. Anything could happen on this show. There's going to be profanity. So if you're a child, you can scoot on out. Uh, we'd also like to thank our supporters over at moneygrab.bscotch.net. We have a new, a new, we got a fresh one. We got a live one this time mm. around. Uh, Amber uh, said, bold, mild breakfast, light, dark, drip, Ooh. percolated, vacuum, cold brew, icy brew. Enjoy these funds to enjoy coffee. Or tea, however you see fit. Thanks for being an energizing aspect of my before work routine. Mm, thanks. I hope those funds cover, cover every single one of those in one go. Yeah. You know I what think it, it, she didn't mention is the uh, the herb infusion thing. What is it called? The tain. Oh, Tazane. 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 Tain. Tain. on the Tain train. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we'd also like to thank our recurring supporters as well. All right. Let's talk about life. I want to talk about. I want to talk about. What you got? All right, buddy. You guys know this saying, uh, you get out what you put in, hmm? right? Or this like garbage in, garbage out is another sort of more negative way to slant that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I've been thinking about this because because we, what we know about people is that like everything that you do is somehow sort of informed by everything that you have done and everything that's happened to you and all that stuff, right? right? So, but it's complicated, right? Because, because if you have a, a machine, like a car or something, you know what it's for. It's... It's supposed to drive you around, and if you mistreat the car, if you don't change the oil, you know, if you if you fill the back seat with laundry, mm-hmm. then now you can't drive your friends around, all that kind of stuff, right? So there's some real obvious like sort of functional like, problems. Yeah, get, okay, right, because you know what the output is supposed to be, right? So uh, you can tell which parts are garbage and which, right? Yeah. So you're like, well, mm-hmm. I'm getting garbage out of this because yeah. uh, it's literally my car is full of garbage, and you literally put garbage I put into garbage it. in it, yeah. so <laughs> this this really tracks, yeah. you know, I'm feeling it. Yep. Um, and it's also true in programming because, you know, like you can tell when your output is garbage and it's always because your input is garbage. Right. You give it you give it crap and you get crap out on the other side, right? Yeah. And so people are the, the same, mm. right? You you give yourself like, oh, I'm going to eat a, a whole bag of mini eggs today. And you know that that's going to turn into garbage in in a variety of ways. I think the problem is like people – so people are machines. You know, like we we move around. We interact with the world. We're doing stuff. But we're not cars, Right. Like what, yeah. what's the point of a person? It's hard to tell. So you're saying because so, you can't quantify the purpose of yourself, it's hard to understand when you're giving yourself garbage. Right. I think it's, I think there's out. a, I think there's a disconnect, but I think you can, you can kind of infer it, mm-hmm. you know, like, or choose it or what you just choose. You, well, do, right. you choose what you're right. You, you have yeah. to decide what you're, you have to decide what your machine is for. One man's trash is another man's treasure. That's you know? true. Right. It could One be those situations. In some cases, trash is just trash for everybody. <laughs> Sometimes it is. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, cause I was thinking about, you know, we've talked in the past about this idea that your brain gets really good at whatever you make it do a lot. You know, if you watch a lot of TV, your brain gets really good at watching TV because the input sort of informs the output. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, uh, in this case, I think being good at watching TV really just means that that you're sort of like you can't stop watching TV. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you, you have a hard time making decisions to do other things. Um, and I don't know. I just I just thought I was thinking about it over this weekend that this sort of like you get out what you put in input equals output kind of a thing. It's just kind of an interesting way to think about like what you're doing in mm-hmm. your life and how that kind of relates to your goals. Because everything you do is either going to kind of like help you get there or it isn't going to help you get there. Uh, well, but the important note there is you have to know where there is. Yeah. That's what the you gotta have goals first. Yeah, that's what the car analogy why that makes that so easy to understand because you're like, well, because there, there's car. a there there. There's a there there, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> and so yeah, so you end up being like, okay, yeah, I get it. I get, I understand the purpose of this car. I fucked up the purpose oh, of this I, car. I, I don't have a. Oh, I, I took one of the wheels off, and now it's not exactly. going as good. So the question yeah. is, what's the equivalent? And and maybe this comes down to you know, like Adam was saying about the picking your goals or picking your philosophy mm-hmm. about your approach. Because really, I don't think human like you. You get you need enough of a point to be able to essentially judge the materials you're putting in as they relate to that output, right? 
Right. And I think you can you can choose that baseline point, which is like, I want to feel good daily, which includes, you know, your general health stuff, like actually sleeping, for example, mm-hmm. or not eating garbage all the time. But then once you get beyond that, like I think those are kind of the easier ones because they're a very direct thing. But even then, they, they aren't as direct. So like if you – true. They're still like, not super direct. Yeah, like you – I mean, my so my last week was yeah, garbage. I, I can eat my, it. Or like, it yes, was, it was. But like, I can eat a cookie right now, and it and, I, and it's not going to kill me. And actually, you kind of feel yeah. a little bit better for a while. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's the real problem. But if I eat two <laughs> cookies right now, mm-hmm. and then I, or if I eat a cookie every day, you know, now that starts to become more Something problematic, else. right? So it's it's a fuzzier, right? It's so a fuzzier you, had, you had a garbage week last week. Is that why you're? Well, yeah, because I was thinking about this because Christmas. basically, so last night I slept for twelve hours because I was just mm. like, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. I don't even want to, I don't want to, <laughs> don't even want to be alive right now. Um, <laughs> it was a combination of like I had a, a dental crisis where essentially I was just in excruciating uh, face pain for like three straight days. Is it all gone by the way? It's mostly gone by now. Okay, feeling better. Um, but I, and so of course this, this then throws off my, my week. Cause now I'm scheduling emergency dental appointments, multiple of them and like driving around town, missing work. Um, and on top of that, my dog has a sinus infection oh, and, no, Coco. and she, and, but at the start, like maybe it wasn't maybe just a cold, but that means what that means is that she's having a hard time sleeping. Right. And so it's kind of a combination of like, basically there's a small, orange animal just like making a lot of sneeze noises and then like walking around the house like <laughs> clacking toenails on the hardwood you know and she's not that small she's 40 pounds you know but you know, uh, big enough to clack yeah yeah and so so you've i've got this thing like i just can't sleep like all week because my dog can't sleep and she mm. you know she can't figure out why she can't sleep so she's like maybe if i just kind of like walk it off or like move it around <laughs> a little bit um to and, be fair also if my nose is completely clogged at night i actually go run up and down the stairs a bunch of times yeah I, mean, I don't know if you guys do that, <laughs> but I do not do that. <laughs> For some reason, just like it just we've all it just that. empties yeah. me out. It's great. It's an instinct. It's an animal instinct. <laughs> I just take Mucinex, and that's my strategy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was that, um, and then, and I think also compounding that with you know we had a whole bunch of sort of like uh, work related, we did like quarterly review and all kinds of stuff. Uh, where it was really productive in the sense that we thought a lot about what we're working on and about our projects and stuff. But at the same time, it's that kind of work that doesn't have an obvious uh, output, right? So like I couldn't have like pointed at a line of code that I wrote that day and be like, I did that, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the work so, also, and it also had a different cadence. So usually we have a very strict, you know, Tuesday, Thursday production schedule, or yeah. a bunch of work happening between it. It was a lot of meetings and stuff as we're yep. sort of figuring out this next chunk yeah. of work. And so, so this all kind of culminated and then finally – uh, Saturday night. I just didn't sleep because the dog was bad enough and then mm. like took her to the, the veterinarian and to get antibiotics and everything. And she's doing great now. Um, but it all kind of culminated in this just like I was thinking about like, you know, sometimes there's some really obvious things that happen where you, you look at them and you're like, that's going to fuck me up mm-hmm. for the next, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for right, the next right. while. Uh, but but it kind of got me thinking about all the other things that I was doing because what also happened was like the the more garbage my inputs became, the more garbage inputs I took in. Yeah, like yep. over the, over the course of the week, I'm like, yeah, I'm not going. I'm not going to the gym. My face hurts. I'm that's tired. The, you know, that's I, so, the spiral. Yeah, yeah, so I'm not going to the gym. Now I'm feeling like crap because I'm just like not taking care of myself, and then I'm also not sleeping because I'm not sleeping. My willpower is lower, so I'm like, I gotta have I gotta have me some mini eggs, mm-hmm. and I'm just eating Cadbury mini eggs. <laughs> All week, you know, I'm feeling like crap. I'm like sitting on the toilet all morning every day. <laughs> this is terrible. Yeah, and, and it just it just like creates this horrible spiral where like my terrible inputs then become an even more terrible sequence. Oh, we talked about inputs. in the past how how that that aspect, the bad stuff, is always a gas. It yeah. just always it just yeah. grows. It fills up all available space and it keeps on going. But it's also it's even worse now because it's also a gas that sort of self replicates. So not only does it get everywhere, but it gets denser over time too, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. So it can just keep on extending and its little and, and a gas it's a gas that becomes a solid, you know, it solidifies over time and kind of like yeah, it, it fills it's, up it's it harder fi- to get in there. Yeah, it's like it'll fill up the holes in your like maybe TV or whatever. Like it'll fill up the holes in your schedule and then it kind of crystallizes in there. So it's really like that uh that spray insulation. You yeah, mm, yeah. Like, like, like that foam. It was going to fill all put the a little bit in there and suddenly it just takes up the whole fucking space. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So by the end of the week last week, I found myself, I'm on Reddit. I'm on Netflix. I'm mm. watching YouTube videos. I'm You're deep in the darkest I'm, I'm jungle. I'm eating mini eggs. I'm just downing uh, these weird uh, fr- fruity drinks. I love this. I don't remember what they're called. They're those weird Buy, drinks. I guess. Yeah. That's the ones you had. Uh, I'm just teas. downing those. Granted, it's probably better than a lot of other things. Like probably like not the, as much as you might hope. They have a little I mean, caffeine in them. That's about it. It, it, it. 
it's not like I'm drinking the, you know, those, those naked drinks. Mm-hmm. Those have like 53 grams of sugar. Yeah. Per they're just sugar. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, they, yeah, they're, they're like really over tasty. in the health section, you know, and I saw one that was called like green machine. It's like, it's got like spinach and shit in there. You know, it's all healthy and stuff. Yeah. And, and they're I flip good. it over and it's like, you know, you know how you make a drink that's made of spinach taste good? We're putting 53 grams of sugar <laughs> in it. Uh, so anyway, everybody take care of yourselves. It's think. important. Well, I think the, the, the note here, though, is that, is that there's a stacking problem, right? Which is that with all this stuff, the longer you don't attend to like a new problem that comes up, the more likely it is to create a cascade of problems because of other things that stack up yeah. later. So it's like it's like playing an MMO, right? You got – you got mm-hmm. debuff stacks on your character. Mm-hmm. You got to keep the you got to keep peeling them off because otherwise, like you might not get all of them off. That's fine, but you got to make sure you don't, you know, hit max stacks and then maybe explode or something. That's right. or whatever the because you're the bomb now. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's what happens. We've all seen. We've that. all been there. We've all been yeah. there. Yeah. And, so, and sometimes you know maybe you got to have your your uh, your healer buddy come in and cast a cleanse on you. Yeah. You know they come in and like, hey, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Slap you around. <laughs> Cleanse. Get those debuffs off. Mm-hmm. You know, each one is like a half a percent. But man, that shit adds up. That adds up real quick. Real bad. Yeah. So I think I think framing it, you know, in terms of like like whatever I'm doing right now is going to become output later. Like it's going to change my behavior later. It's going to change how I feel later. It's going to change. It's going to do something. So just kind of like keeping that in mind kind of helps keep maybe keep the wheels on well, just a little mm-hmm. bit longer. Mm-hmm. You know, as you're as you're navigating these things. Anyway. So that was, that was my week last week. It's rough. That's pretty, pretty something. Yeah, it's pretty something. <laughs> All right, let's talk about TypeScript. Adam. Yeah, so I don't, have, I don't have a lot to say. It's just that because we don't want to get into the weeds here in, in this podcast. What even is this? Um, but yeah, people have asked about it in the Discord on, on many occasions. So I thought I would just get into it real quick, which is so so all of our web tech, Rumpus, all that backend stuff is built using straight up JavaScript. It's wonderful. The whole stack, everything that talking to the database, talking to everything is using JavaScript so that I only have to learn one fucking programming language to actually do it. Mm-hmm. So that's all great. Uh, and JavaScript is fun, loosey goosey, wild west programming, uh, just super satisfying to use. It does have a problem, though, that grows over time, much like this whole garbage in, garbage out problem, mm-hmm. which is that uh, because it is just the wild west, things can just kind of. You they get just, bandits in They there. just start to take up space. You know, you, you just start, you just start to, you take, you do a little clever trick here, you do a little clever trick there, and they kind of start to add up and accumulate. Mm. And then eventually. And now you've tricked yourself. You've tricked yourself because you've built, because like, because, you know, I built this, this, uh, this software stack over now two years, right? So it's two years worth of work in, in, in this code. And some of it I haven't seen even for those two years, mm-hmm. right? Because it was like the first things that I wrote. Uh, and over time, it becomes very, very hard to actually have to figure out how to work on stuff. You know, when you want to add a new thing, when you want to go fix something else that's in there, whatever. I call that a software rot or yeah. software entropy. It yes. just kind of deteriorates. It just like, kind I don't of deteriorates. know what I'm looking at. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when it comes to when it comes to using JavaScript, uh, the only thing that can help you is your own brain, because since there are no rules really. Then there aren't any tools that can help you because the tools are also like I don't fucking know what you were trying to do. Here, you know? <laughs> uh, this is a you problem. Yeah, and so <laughs> so this is basically the argument for something like mm. TypeScript. Or so so there's an idea in programming of a typed language, which, which is one where you say like I say this thing is a string. It can you know a sequence of characters. It can only be a string for the rest of time, right? Or this you thing is a you number. Can't change it into you something can't change else. it into something else. Yes, we can't add it. And you can't treat it yeah. like it. <laughs> you can't treat it. You can't. Yeah. You can't now like add this thing. You can't add this string to a number and say that that's mm-hmm. fine and whatever. Right. Uh, so so this is an idea that I always consider to be shitty and it sucks. It makes it makes it sucky to program, right? Because you sit down and you just want you just want to do some stuff. You like, just I want to be free, man. You want to be free. And you're, and you're like four plus three point one, and the computer's like, I don't fucking know, yeah. man. What or is or this? it calls it seven because it, the first one was an integer in it, so it's like, oh, you must want to do integer math. So I'll just go ahead and auto cast this other one to an integer. Yeah, four you don't need that point yeah. one. That's be probably that's, yeah. So <laughs> so lots of. Uh, so I, I prefer my my programming language to be like, I'm going to do what's probably best, you know, because most of the time that's what I want. And that works out great. Uh, but but there is this cost, which is that as as complexity grows and as as your project gets bigger, then now you just have to know in your brain everything. literally everything. And that's the only way you can get by. And so this kind of came to a head last week because we're we realized that uh, we've talked on the podcast before about the the ink vac, the ink bot mm-hmm. system we have where Sam makes art. A little robot sees it. It appears, converts it into something that Seth can use in the game. And Seth runs a little script that pulls it into the game. And so the no human hands have to touch any of this stuff. Right. Uh, well, we realized that human we, hands are dirty. 
they're, they're dirty. They make mistakes. Yeah. They're not very agile. No, no. They, they got, get they get diseases in them. Or yeah. rather, they're super agile, but not in a consistent way over time. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, gotta, you gotta practice to have them be agile. You know? yeah. It's like if you want to be a concert pianist, you gotta practice for like a thousand mm-hmm. years. Unless right? you build a concert piano playing robot. Yeah. Then it's you know, Which is yeah. actually a lot easier than building a than become a, a human pianist. Yeah. <laughs> pianist. Uh and so we were, so Seth realized last week that he hadn't put any of, of our beautiful new sounds in the game for like two months or something ridiculous. They've been piling up. Uh, because Sorry, <laughs> yeah, because he's been doing all that manually, and because we didn't have a system for that. So then last week we we're like, okay, we should we should have a sound vac, right? So I sat down to make it in JavaScript again because that's that's my that's my go to deal. And and basically what I had to do was create a program that just kind of reflects exactly how Game Maker works as a like how how its file structure works, so that I can manipulate all these files and stuff. Which meant that the code had to have like some awareness of how Game Maker works, which is all very convoluted and weird. And then I had to know both how that worked and how my code worked. And so I had to, had to have mm. all of this shit stored in my brain. It's a heavy cognitive it's load. It's a high cognitive load. And so as I was working on it, I just kept on getting more and more confused about stuff. Because like I had this – like what I thought was a very clever way of making all of it work together. But the problem was it was just clever enough that it was really hard to keep track of. You know? mm-hmm. A little and so too was, clever. A little too clever. So I, was, so I was doing this and after a while I was like, this doesn't need to be this hard because – if if my if my actual tooling could do work for me and then just give me hints and be like oh yeah this was the, this is this kind of an object this is this kind of a thing or whatever then I wouldn't have typed. to if things were typed for example <laughs> uh, there you go. so so like, like uh, all the way through Friday like I finally got enough done that I that I felt like I got a good foundation and I was like fuck it I'm gonna come back on Monday having converted this project into a TypeScript project Ooh. which meant learning TypeScript first so I did a Udemy course and then spent basically all my Sunday sort of afternoon evening converting this project into TypeScript and like mm-hmm. figuring out how the fuck all that stuff works and got it all, got it all to work. And now I'm feeling fucking great because it was already, even just as I was doing it, I was like, Oh, I see how this is going to be better. This is going to be nice. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be very, very useful. So you're going to be converting any of Rumpus over to TypeScript? No. Can, okay. Uh, and, well, and here's <laughs> like the, the, cause even this was a small project cause I only been working on it for a day. Right. And even doing that took a lot of effort because basically Basically, what I did is I just changed everything to and said like, "Oh, this is just TypeScript now," and then looked at the infinite errors that came out, and then just went through and like addressed all of them, right? Which you did that to a two-year project. Yeah, that would be some time. It would take a fucking nightmare um, to sort those. But you can you can kind of mix the two together a bit, and so I'm considering like moving forward in Rumpus, maybe modules and stuff. Yeah, using that. Um, I'm not quite sure how it's going to work. I think I just need to to learn more first. Um, But it was it was. It was just kind of a funny thing because I've been so resistant to doing this. And, and we've been talking to the podcast for the past few months about DevOps and about streamlining your process and making your tools work for you and making, you know, reducing human error and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and, and the cost of all of those is always some sort of a higher overhead somewhere, whether yep. it's like making your tools or it's whether it's establishing a practice. Front loaded work. It's front loaded work, yeah. uh, establishing design patterns, establishing ways of, of collaborating, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. But the end result is that your errors go way the fuck down. Um, you get to deliver stuff way faster once you, you know, once you get there. Uh, and I could just already see that being very clear that, that was going to happen. So I think it was a good transition, but yeah, people have asked about the past. are like, do you use, do you use TypeScript? Or why not? My answer always was, well, cause I'm working by myself. So I just don't need to. Cause the other advantage you get from something like that is that other people can read your fucking code. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> one of those but, weird things. <laughs> yeah. But nobody needs to. So I was but like, then when you, know, you but fine. then when you can't read your own code, yeah. cause it's two years old. Well, and it's not even, but that was, <laughs> a, that was a part that I didn't fully appreciate. Cause it's, cause I can always figure out what my own code is doing. Right. Uh, and it actually wasn't then about that. It was about, it was about, the fact that this code is complex and like all these parts need to be able to talk to each other. It helps actually simplify the complexity. It then. simplifies yeah. the complexity because now you, you don't have to use your own brain to keep track. You just let the computer do the work for you. And that was, a, that was the thing I did not appreciate enough until I finally buckled down and started to do it. So yes, life yeah, lesson with that kind of a increased overhead of DevOps kind of stuff. I think it, the interesting way to frame it that we've kind of been talking about in, in the studio is thinking about it like insurance, Yeah, which is like, with insurance, you pay a, a premium every month. You just you pay a known amount of money, and then when something bad happens, which guess what, it's, it's, it's gonna mm-hmm. you yeah. know you you're around long enough, bad shit's gonna happen. Yep. And uh, and at that point, if you didn't have the insurance, now all of a sudden you're facing a catastrophic scenario. Yeah. Right. So you you instead you front load it, and you're just like I'm just gonna pay out a little bit at a time, consistently yep. in a predictable way, so that when bad stuff happens, I'm covered. Right. Yep. And just so, like with insurance, you can complain about it, and I used to, but now I actually, 
I always like buy as much insurance I as I can. Insurance. I'm so covered. It's great. It's one of my favorite things. <laughs> yeah. And it's uh, and like, and it, I told and you it, there's going to be adult topics in the podcast, yeah. kids. <laughs> and it no longer even bothers me that that money comes out of my paycheck. Right? Now, because I will it's say. that whole like, I know I'm, I'm guarded against catastrophic loss. I will say, I do not buy warranties. I don't either. Um, because I know that those are actually, for, for small value items, yeah, like, value like if I buy a keyboard for like $80, yeah. like, do you want the warranty on this? I'm like, no, because. I can I can I can absorb that loss if I need well, to get because, another Well because because you will buy infinite small things in your lifetime which yeah, is and I, and that's how insurance right. is supposed to cover that and, and the, so there's no point in also yeah, covering Yeah and also the overhead of keeping track of like which things are under warranty and for how long yeah. and who to call no thanks mm. yep. I'm not I'm not all about that it sounds like work it sounds like a lot of work yeah. yeah uh so anyway all right so that's interesting good Ooh. job so your weekend was a lot like mine <laughs> like very productive. I mean, weekend, there, there were some parts that were not as some productive. parts. Were I mean, we needed to do garden work because it was beautiful outside, mm-hmm. and then you know, Saturday rolled around, and you just did. didn't. <laughs> you, know, just did. and, you know, we went outside and did like you know we were outside and like you know, did some stuff and got to enjoy the beautiful weather, and then just didn't do any gardening. Yeah. And then Sunday rolled around, and we had you know went, went out did our morning workout. So we got home. We were like, oh, we got home. We really should you know go. Like Garden. we're already sweaty and gross mm-hmm. anyway. Might as well go do some gardening. No, we just didn't. You know? <laughs> uh, the garden's like help me. Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just that. So there was that piece that I definitely did not do that mm-hmm. I should have been doing. Well, you can't win them all, yeah. you know. But yeah, I did get some programming done, so I feel good oh, yeah. about that. See, so, you know, my back's been hurt, and I did this PT uh, last week or so. That's uh, that's PT Cruiser. Yeah. PT Cruiser, you put it on your back, it rolls yeah, about out. Rolls, so it, rolls those kicks out. <laughs> but this is PT, and, and it. Which is I woke up therapy. Yeah, I woke up on Saturday morning feeling great, and I slept for like ten hours on accident. So I slept until nine o'clock, which I've not done in I don't even know how long. So just, wake up. You woke up and then you just like fuck it and just keep going. Just yeah, lay back down. It was incredible. I woke up, <laughs> I felt great, and my back didn't hurt, and I was like, oh, here we are, we've arrived. And then I was feeling all like. Mm, feeling good, feeling good about everything. So I go and I do my stretches for my back. And then I was so enthusiastic. I was in the middle of the kitchen. You're like, I'm going to do some deadlifts. <laughs> <laughs> I did some push-ups. <laughs> so I was like, I'm gonna do some, I haven't gotten to work out in like weeks. So I did some push-ups in the kitchen. And I get up and I'm just doing some stuff. And then all of a sudden I get this like horrifyingly painful like knot in my back left shoulder blade. Nice. Which I don't know if you guys have had back spasms before of any sort. I've not had a back spasm. Like a think. muscle spasm. Uh, but apparently that's what this is. And so, and the funny thing was I had just finished sort of like one from having slept really weird during all this back stuff mm-hmm. and just sort of the pain finally went away on like Wednesday. Okay. So I had, I had one morning of just feeling good, <laughs> did some push ups, and then now I can't look left. So that's where I'm at, you know? <laughs> yep. This, this is, this is just this. being a grown adult and human. Yep. This is, this is why we I'm have chairs it. with swivels. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because, because of some days you just can't look left or right. <laughs> it's just how life is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My... After all my gut surgery and stuff, like my thing is that about once every six weeks, uh, it, only in the morning, it'll be like after I drink some water or something like nothing. I'm not doing anything weird. All of a sudden, it just feels like I got punched in the gut. And that, that lasts about 20 minutes, but it's like a really it's like the kind of doubling over yeah. sort of sensation, you know, and uh, it happens rarely. So I'm assuming that's a spasm also, but probably like a gut <laughs> it's, like, it's like my whole gut just suddenly just hurts a lot. So that's fun. To just like every so often, it just well, every, it's, so, every it's, so, it's so weird. How like I think I think right past twenty five, these things just start to happen at an increasing uh, frequency. Yeah, they know? they they're no they're no longer that disconcerting for me for this. Like you, you know, your tooth thing last week, right? Because you're like, oh, my tooth hurts a lot, but like that's just a thing that can happen. Yeah, I was, I was, so you wouldn't yeah. suspect <laughs> it's a real problem, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, if once it was going for two days, then yeah. I was like, it still is debilitating. So I'll probably um, get that checked out at that point. Probably get that looked at. Yeah, I was having a couple weeks ago, I was having this, like, on the left side of my face, I was having these, like, really painful, like, (laughs) like, sharp kind of headache (laughs) sensations, right? But but, but ones I've never had before. And so that started just, like, in the middle of the afternoon, uh, about two weeks ago while I was programming. It was, like, it was painful enough that it was distracting, but it would come into kind of these pulses. Yeah. Right? And I was like, this this seems bad, but also. But also, maybe it's not. But also, it's probably just a normal thing. This and, is probably uh, just my body very slowly dying. Yeah, this and, is- and it wasn't happening constantly. It was just every like you know half an hour or something like that. Also, I get this kind of pulse in there, <laughs> and so so then so I let, I let that go for two days, and then it went away. Yep. Sure enough, sure enough, it just is. Was well, so it interesting? Note though, that the the physical therapist guy was like, "It's actually really good." He's like, "You're recovering super fast from all this. He's mm-hmm. like, it's super good that you're fit." Yeah, and he was like, "You don't even understand how long this would take." He's like, "This is not a big issue that you have currently." He's like, this would take you like two to three months to recover from if you weren't 
like as if active. You weren't already taking care of yourself. Yeah. 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 And he's like, so good job. Garbage in, garbage, garbage out. Yeah. yeah. It was probably true for all of your, all of your chemotherapy and shit. Too. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. They said I had a really strong response. Yeah. Physically, I was able to recover much faster than most people. Cause, yeah. Like, because the fact that you were taking you heart poison and then you can yeah. still. And then you still have a better heart than anybody else. Yeah. You know, like, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, there's, there's some real truth. You gotta, you gotta stay in there. Yeah. Back yeah. during Sam's, uh, back policy. during Sam's chemotherapy days, I remember we saw, we did an EKG mm-hmm. and they were like, wow, your heart has 100% throughput. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen this before. Cause like, cause basically when you, when your heart pulses to pump blood through, then like a, a pretty it leaves decent, a little bit of blood behind. A pretty you know? decent rate is like you know seventy or eighty percent of the blood gets pushed through, and then like some of it. I assume we're just making up those numbers. For, I think that's what they said at okay. the time. I think it was like sixty to seventy percent is the usual. I think I mine, guess, was like, mine was like ninety. I just know. I just know it's, that Jenny is going to be editing this podcast and whatever she's oh, yeah, going to be rolling around. Like, How right dare now. you? Yeah, <laughs> right, I don't have a hundred percent efficient heart. That would be incredible. All right, so let's, let's frame it this way: It's when your heart pumps, some blood is left behind. Yeah, and. When Sam's heart pumps, almost no blood is left. Almost no blood is left. <laughs> yeah. uh, Screw the percentages. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I can make this but we were we were looking at that, and then I I was kind of think because I also know your resting heart rate is like forty yeah. or some crazy shit. And then I was thinking about that uh, character from Parks and Rec, Chris Traeger, <laughs> who's yeah, like, yeah. but he's like the doctor said that my heart could pump jet fuel up into an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> I was like that's. Yeah, that's, that's exactly. And what I think it is. even after even after years of of being poisoned, it's still still they still got it. still far still better heart it. health than I have. I remember I was so flattered because they were like, "You could be a heart model." And yeah. I was like, mm, "Thank you." That was, <laughs> actually, why, yeah, why isn't that <laughs> on your LinkedIn profile? Heart model. Yeah, mm, you got to get know. well. You got to get paid to do it once. Yeah, first. I got to go do it. Maybe I should do. There's that. any heart just, just so I can just have do it once. Yeah, I'm a CV. Yeah. Yeah, if there's any EKG companies out there who are looking for some <laughs> just some sweet heart action yeah. to put onto their, uh, gotcha. I guess EKG they advertise in magazines and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, there's a problem because it's because it's sort of just <laughs> they like, always Photoshop it though. It's always it's yeah. Just, yeah. The thing is yeah. just like just like models are always like like regular people don't look like that, right? right? And regular hearts don't and look even like the models right? themselves so, don't look like that, right? So <laughs> what's so what's even the point of a heart model if the whole idea is like here's the ideal heart that nobody has? What do, just, you, what do you do with that information? It's just like regular modeling, which you, it makes – you're impressed and it makes and you feel bad feels bad. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's fair. You know? Yeah. But it makes you feel good about like the clothes or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or the monitor. Something. You know? The monitor. Something, yeah. something like it that. Makes, yeah. It makes the monitor look real good because that about. heart. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The goodness of the heart elevates the quality of the product. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's talk about level head. What about it? It's not out yet. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> But it will be. It's still coming out this month. It's still coming Soon. out this month. So every uh, our people in the Butterscotch <laughs> Discord have been like speculating, trying to figure out when it's coming out. So people are like, if it comes out on four twenty, it's going to be Hilarious. crazy. But that's a, that's a Saturday. Saturday. Yeah, so, we're not doing that. You know, or, or we are. Who knows? Yeah, you don't watch games on a Saturday, or do you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Uh, so just keep an eye out. Mm-hmm. It will come. It'll be a bit yeah. one you day. Should, you should go wish list it while you're waiting. You know, you should. Uh, you should do probably some other. That's it. That's really it. stuff. Just wish list it. it uh, tell your uh, tell your friends. Your cubicle mate. Tell everybody you know to just wish list it and wait. I guess take your dog. I mean, this is, it's not a lot of action. Yeah, it's not a very good to call to action right now. Which is kind of yeah. You know, why we're trying to get it out so people can can do stuff with it. That's yeah, all the action wish. is in the game. That's a very intense game. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. So there's not much going on outside of it. Yeah. So keep an eye out. It'll happen. It's gonna be on. It's gonna soft be on. Soft be on. At some point. <laughs> soft be on. Um, <laughs> and otherwise, we just have a couple of reminders before we get on to some industry news. A couple of reminders about what's going on in the near future. For starters, uh, shop.bscotch.net. It's gonna shut down at some point because mm-hmm. we're we're running out of merch and everything's on sale. So if you're wanting, sure, there's fewer boxes in here. Yeah, yeah it's feeling hey, better. people are. It's going. It's it's slowly falling off the shelves, as they say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, it was all uh, the price is gently, just, just, gently just kind of wafting, <laughs> wafting away. Yeah. So, they're drifting away. Uh, so, the prices of all of our merch is slashed, and we're going to be switching to a limited run model at some point in the near future. Where at that point, we're going to like have a shirt, we'll take orders, and then just ship them all at once and that yeah. kind of thing. So, uh, last call for merch. Yep. Get them also, uh, Shenanicon is coming up uh, September 28. Tickets are 25 bucks if you want to get tickets to come to St. Louis for a Saturday afternoon. Come hang out with us. We're going to do a live podcast and just kind of have a good time. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's going to be over at meat.bscotch.net, M-E-E-T or M-E-A-T. Just whatever however you like. However you, however like, you like your meat, uh, that's what we got. So <laughs> uh, 
Uh, then the last event coming up is the Shenana Jam, which is our uh, annual game jam that we host, where if you're interested in making games, then you can participate and make games alongside us and our community over, with the power of the internet. No matter how much or little you know about making games. Yep. Yeah, and we, yeah, we get that question. A lot of people are like, if I've never made games before, if I don't know how to program or whatever, can't like – is this is that bad? Can I should I partner with somebody? It's like just just get in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't even worry about it. Yep. You know, because if you put this is that the inspirational thing about game jams is if you 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 find out that if you just put one hundred percent of your time and focus into this over a weekend, even if you come into it knowing absolutely nothing, you will come out with a game. Yeah, or something game like game like it's just oddly game shape. <laughs> something game shape. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's always been the case that whenever we go to game jams in person or over the internet or whatever, people come out of it so pumped and so inspired about what they're capable of doing that they never even could have imagined. It'll blow the lid off your expectations of yourself. Yes. Yeah. Uh, So that's over at uh, shenanajam.com, and that's happening July 12th, and it's over that whole weekend. So yeah. set aside the time. It's going to happen. It's going to be great. We're hoping to get over 400 people this year. We had 399 last year, which just, was just by an inch. Which was here's we, the we had 399, and then like on people. on the day before, like three people left it. Yeah. So we got we got we were we hoping to get that one more. And the then end. and then people just just despite us made it a little bit worse. <laughs> yeah. So that bummed me out. So we got to hit we got to hit 400 this year. It's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Arbitrary goals are important yeah. to have. Yeah, yeah, you gotta know what the garbage is. Exactly. You know, to get the garbage you garbage want. Garbage is three ninety nine. That's not enough. No. That's terrible. That's a terrible result. Oh. Only three hundred and ninety nine. <laughs> Come on. Uh, all right, let's talk about industry news. There's only one thing to talk about, which is the ongoing Ooh. PC exclusive war. Exclusives war. Except it's not really a war because only one of them's doing it. Yeah, there's only one playing the game right now. Yeah. <laughs> So it's a one-sided war. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty one-sided. So uh, uh, Epic secured Borderlands Three for a six-month for six. All oh, the other ones have been a one-year exclusive, so that's kind yeah. of interesting that they had a maybe shorter, they're shorter. Rope maybe they're on this one. running out of money, or they're putting less money into these titles. I imagine it probably cost a lot more to get Borderlands Three than most other titles probably. as an exclusive. So they probably they probably had to cut a deal where they were like, okay, fine, we'll take, we'll we'll cut that down so we can. That do said, it. so of course the usual. Things happen on the internet, which is a bunch of people screamed about it, you know, in the usual ways that they do, which is comment sections and PC Gamer, the subreddits, all this stuff. And then also by review bombing. And review bombing, because of course, this game, unlike uh, past titles, which, you know, were on Steam temporarily and then I like, came off to go to Epic or whatever, uh, this one never touched Steam, like completely. There's, but, but other games, other Borderlands games are on there. All of them in fact. Borderlands 1 and 2 and like some of the spin yeah. So So basically to vent their frustration, um, a mob went and review bombed Borderlands 2. Uh, but this is right after, so I think only two or three weeks ago, yeah. uh, Steam. So Steam has been doing a little bit to try to, to try to curb this whole review bombing thing. And yeah, because so, it turns out when you, give, when you give users a review system, they will, they will weaponize it. Yeah. Well, what, they'll weaponize anything. Yeah. Just literally Any, anything. anything that they that they can do that will in any way impact another person. Yeah, they, they will, will use it for that. that. Yeah. Even if it's just writing a comment on a YouTube video. Yep. Anything. Yeah. And so so this has been a problem for, for quite some time and a kind of a notorious one. Um and Steam has been making these incremental changes to deal with it. And so a while ago, I think probably maybe I don't know, even a year ago now, mm-hmm. they implemented this whole detection system where they have like a little graph showing the relative rate of positive and negative reviews, yeah. and it and it tries to predict when something is in the middle of a re, of a review bomb, so that it can kind of show you a little message that's like, hey, this is abnormal activity. There might be something weird going on here, or whatever. And it also gives you the option of kind of like filtering in or out the results depending on that. Right. So they they already had that thing, um, but that was only going to be that was only useful for those savvy consumers who would then go there see a negative review score and then be like i wonder if this is currently being review bombed and then let's scroll down the list to see the graph to see the graph right, right? and so so that sort of this this next kind of final piece of this puzzle uh, that steam implemented just a few weeks ago was to say well if these what they they basically finally asked the question what are reviews for on our website and they yes. and they decided explicitly that they were for reviewing the, the game, the, the game, the quality <laughs> of, the, mm-hmm. of the game, and the content of the game. Game reviews are for reviewing weird, right? The game, yeah. And and so they they are mm-hmm. they are not for uh, people to vent frustration at a company or at a company's practice, or even necessarily. So like so, if if people hate, say, a monetization practice of a game, like 
then that's fine because that's, it's that's an game. aspect of the game, right? Mm-hmm. That's all. So so this doesn't completely remove people's ability to be pissed off about stuff at all. It just it just locks it's it just to about the game. The game. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as opposed to the third game in the series, yeah, in this that's case. completely unrelated. Yeah. Uh, and so so they, so they made this explicit policy that that's what it's for, and and then they they added to this. Uh, this whole detection system they currently have the ability where they can just go in like a, like steam staff can go in and just actually make it so that reviews no longer count towards the score between some date range. So basically uh, some, some like steam SWAT team gets alerted when one of these algorithms detects a review mm. bomb and they come in they're like, and they look at the reviews and they didn't to ask the question, are these on topic? Is it like, it was this due to a recent patch that actually is bad in which right. case this is fine. Uh, or is this due to some political issue? Like people are upset because there's a woman in it. Uh, mm-hmm. Cause that's, you know, also a thing that happens uh, or like what, what is the, what is the thing going on here? And, and so then they make that decision uh, to, to just basically say, okay, starting from this date uh, until we decide that the review bomb is over, then these votes just don't count. Right. They still go in there. So their views still go in there, which means people still get to vent their frustration. They still get to do all that stuff. The graph is still there. Like you still get to see all of that. So users still have the opportunity to to do that to vent their frustration. Uh, but now for yeah. all for the rest of us who don't give a fuck about any of that, yeah. uh, who <laughs> which just is wanted, most people, which is almost everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Now that we can now we can just go see a game and we when we see that review score, we get to know if it's a trustworthy representation of the quality of that game. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think this is a great fucking move by Steam, and they got to test it out just this past weekend yeah. with Borderlands <laughs> Two uh, because it was getting review bombed. Um, so I don't know. I I, I spent part of part well, this of my is kind of weird though, right? Because like, so Valve is in a weird sort of sticky position here because when games get review bombed on Steam, presumably people see that negative review score and they're like, "Well, I'm not buying this game." So presumably that may suppress uh, Steam's overall sales yeah. if review bombing yeah. is prevalent across yep. many popular games, right? So. So they want to. They want, of course, but it will also suppress publishers' desire to be on Steam if users are able to weaponize Steam yes, as a platform right. against the publisher. That's true. So, so basically, it's it's in it's in Valve's interest to sort of you know gird against this weird usage of the review system. But also, um, this means that when when people do what what uh, what Gearbox did and they put Borderlands over on the Epic Store. Uh, knowing that there's going to be a backlash now, uh, the backlash uh, against it that like people saying like, I want this game to be on steam. Here's mm-hmm. my way. I'm going to express it. Now steam itself is suppressing the, the mm-hmm. commentary that the gamers are making. Yep. Even though borderlands three being an exclusive and not being on steam is bad for steam. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, yeah, but it's they, kind of a weird. But they have to. I mean, they have to do it. Well, because the alternative is the alternative is that their <laughs> that their rating system is not a trustworthy system yes. for the average user. Right. And by the average, I mean the majority of users. Because right. again, most users do not give a fuck nope. about any of the stuff that these that these uh, these mobs are really angry about. Mm-hmm. Um. And so, yeah. So I, I think it's it's a hundred percent the right move. But I w- I was really just intrigued by how up in arms people are about all this stuff. And so every once in a while I like to go do a little bit of a dive when someone mm-hmm. like, like, so I'll go check go read see, there. See just, gonna, just like, see like, what is it that's going on in people's brains when they're so upset about this stuff? And, and so for this one, people were, so now people of course are upset at steam for making it so that, you know, their, their voices can no longer be heard. Mm. Uh, be, and, and despite the fact that, again, the reviews are still there, they're still at the top because they're the most recent. Mm-hmm. It's like, you can see it in the chart. You can see these like these negative things. And so that's not, accurate like that's not what's happening right their, their voices are still being heard they're still allowed to make their protest uh, but what they're angry about is that they actually explicitly wanted it to be the case that they harmed yeah. they wanted to harm they want the to game. harm the developer they want to harm yeah. the developer and they want yeah. to harm the publisher financially because they believe that's the only way they can have their, well, and what they're uh, saying is it's not enough for them to just not buy the the new game uh, that's yeah. coming out they also want to make sure that nobody buys any of the previous games either yeah. right so they want to they would they don't want to just like boycott they want yeah. like, to they're not they trying to like wipe the people. developer exactly from they're existence. actually yeah they're not trying to inform other people and be like hey they're trying to you hurt might people. not like they're actually trying to hurt people that's yeah. that's the goal yeah and uh and because they they believe that that they basically believe that they're the little guy and these companies are the big guy mm-hmm. right and that and these companies are effectively evil because they don't give a shit about what their players want uh and this is, this is, i thought it was really particularly funny because it was in parallel to another thread i looked into mm-hmm. about uh i can't remember which game it was but one, one of the recent oh the the new division game Mm. where where they just released this huge patch and 
and, and it was just it was just hilarious because the, the patch addressed mostly player generated concerns, like a whole bunch of stuff that players didn't really like, like you know some balance issues, some kind of way that some of the things in the in the game behaved. And so, so the division team basically like took a whole bunch of stuff that the, that the users wanted and then did all that stuff. And some of it turned out to not be great, you know, because uh, yeah, that's what happened, you know, because yeah. that's what happens. And, uh, and the amount of backlash and hate they were getting as a consequence was just the same as, as kind of like what Fallout 76 got for like an objectively bad launch, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and even though the stuff that was being implemented was the stuff that, that exactly the community, that the community wanted. wanted yeah. And somebody made, and somebody pointed out, it was like, well, it was only some people in the community that wanted that, but other people want this other thing instead. And it's like, well, that's yeah, always that's true. the whole fucking problem <laughs> yeah. with this. So there, there's, there's just this weird obtuseness with the whole thing where, where, Everybody involved with this, like they they think that the thing that they want to be true, like must be the thing that true. Must otherwise, true, otherwise yeah. they're not being heard or listened to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that if somebody else, another person, another player gets what they want, but that's not what this person wanted, then they still are upset, mm-hmm. right? Because it's not about whether the community is being listened to; it's about whether each well, specific person being is listened. being listened yeah. to. Yeah, and that's really like so. I was reading all this and trying mm-hmm. to figure out like where. What is going on here? Because the the, the amount of of just vitriol is just so. Well, yeah. So what's high, the so what's high. the win condition for the yeah. developer? Like what what does the what is the developer able to do? And that was the thing is there was nothing look, because yeah. then people because then people were like well we don't feel like the developers are listening and, it's, and it's, apparently the division has like a forum where the developers are in constantly like talking back to <laughs> players and stuff yeah. <laughs> uh, and and they're like announcing stuff on their own Reddit they're announcing stuff on Twitter and like yeah. so so you, so you don't mean listening they, you they don't mean listening. that at all they mean like there's it's like the developer isn't handing the design reins of the game exactly. over to me personally yeah that's yeah well, even, not, even, not to the community but to, to me personally me, yeah but then also that this whole epic thing because i was also trying to think like it's if you like if you love a franchise if you love the borderlands games right then presumably you want more of them right mm-hmm. you want them to be to have dlcs you, you want them you want to have right. as much of that as possible well the you get more of that by there being more money involved right that, that's how that works uh and so and now, you're and you're not paying anymore no, no, it's the same. So, you, so yeah. So if yeah. you go, so these games go over to Epic, where the where the you know the publishers will just they outright say, yeah, the cut is so much better over there that we will make literally forty percent more money by going to this other platform. Uh, that you as a player should be pumped about that because that means that it company means is going to have more lands. money, which means more Borderlands and faster. That's what that that's the consequence of that. Uh, instead, you're asking a company to take a position against their own and your best interest to be on a platform that makes them less money. That is. Equally as convenient as this other, like it's just another platform, yeah. right? Uh, and like there, there are a bunch of arguments about people hate the Epic Launcher for this long laundry list of reasons, and that's fine, I get it. But, but the launcher isn't the game. the launcher isn't the game, right? Once you once you open the launcher and click play on the game, you're in the game now. You're just in the game now. Yeah. Uh, mm. So, but so there's this the the people not realizing that all they're doing is self sabotaging because what they're also doing is they're making people not want to be on Steam. Like every time I hear about a review bomb, I'm on the side of the developer almost no matter what. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, and, and that's not even as a, as a developer, but as a player, because I'm just, cause to me, it's like the internet mob, which, which yeah, in yeah, every context I've ever seen, well, the we, internet we've mob, been on the receiving end of a review yeah. bomb yeah. as well. So like, it's just, it's just again, it's just, there's, there's weird obtuseness where like the people, they think they're trying, they think they're accomplishing something and they think it's their only means of doing it, but they're all they're actually doing is working against themselves. Here's, here's the thing. So I watched uh, yesterday, there's a, a YouTube documentary called game umentary which is a weird name but they covered game umentary covered shirley shirley kiri who is the gaming grandma who plays sky oh yeah yeah okay so it's like a 27 minute episode <laughs> yeah and it's literally just her just sitting ch- chatting with them does she stream it and or something yeah, she she, yeah so she she does yeah she does youtube videos every day of her playing skyrim and she basically role plays so she acts like she's oh, a character she? and That's then awesome. like basically builds these stories over time apparently she's going to be in the next one yeah so there, she has so many fans like a half a million subscribers that's great <laughs> <laughs> so and so they're so intense that they got they've basically been petitioning bethesda to get her put into the next elder scrolls game as a companion follower yeah because it's oh like, shit because she loves those companions and so <laughs> And she would like have some of her catchphrases and stuff in there. And so it was really interesting watching that because she entered into YouTube as, of course, a, like octogenarian, right? She's like 83 or something. Yeah. And she was just so like enthused by the whole thing. Like just so excited. Just genuinely pumped about it. Because like, yeah, she was she basically – because she would go and she watched other people's YouTube videos and she would just comment. And she actually started getting subscribers originally because she would just comment on videos and people realized like, oh, there's this – 
grandma who like loves video games. <laughs> yeah. And people just loved that she would just show up and comment on stuff. And so they started and seeing it. I, I assume that all every comment she made was like super wholesome. Oh, yeah, of course. She's like, oh, this kind. is a great video. Like, thanks for the adventure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, like how you would it's actually. It's weird how people respond positively to that kind right. of energy. Yeah. Well, so the important note there is that she treats people on the internet like you would treat a person in real life, right? You just are nice to them generally. Mm-hmm. And so she started getting this little mini following from like just like 300 people or so before she ever published a video. And then published her first Skyrim video, goes to bed, wakes up, and has like you know, a billion views because someone <laughs> posted it on a subreddit. Uh-huh. And so then, of course, starts her actual like YouTuber career. But they talked to her a little bit about – they asked questions like how do you – like what do you handle with comments? How do you handle comments on your YouTube videos? And she had this hilarious line where she basically said, well, you know, usually they're very, very nice. And in fact, in the beginning, they're nicer now than they were before because the community has sort of self – Self curates now. So if yeah. someone's mean to her, the entire rest of the community just descends on them and like, eats <laughs> right. which is exactly how it should be. But uh-huh. she said originally she had to, the way she put it was, um, you know, sometimes when, when someone would say something negative, she'd just talk to them like she would talk to a grandchild who had no brain. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, I love everything about this <laughs> because she's so sweet and so wholesome. And she's just st- stating the fact, which is like the reality is that if you do – if this is not a checked behavior, yeah, this is what happens, right? Yep. And you're like we're, we're very intense in our own discord about like we just don't let people be mean to each other about stuff or to us. Like mm-hmm. you don't get – you, well, and one thing we, <laughs> one thing we also it. know yes, is it's that – It's not a right you have. Is that a lot of time this, this kind of uh, way of acting out is really just somebody needing to be acknowledged. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they just, they just need somebody to look at them and be like, I, Hey, I get it. Like I, mm-hmm. I see where you're coming from. I don't, I don't agree with what you're saying about like what we should be doing with our game or whatever, but I appreciate you taking the time to give us the feedback, you know? And like, oftentimes if you go that route, then almost immediately the, the rage just stops. Yeah. yeah. Like but like, I think the important note is that, is that the one thing missing from that route is actually the condemnation of the tone. Yeah, which that's is true. like it is it is wildly fucking inappropriate to talk to a developer of a game and tell them that yep. you hate them and you want them to die because they changed how the game works. Like that's true. We've gotten that as well. We've gotten that. Yeah. Yeah. Saw, Let that sink in for yeah. a sec. I like, saw. What? Uh, I think it was Ty Ty Taylor. Is that his name? The mm-hmm. the guy who did like the bridge and some other indie games. Um, mm-hmm. But he uh, he on on April Fool's Day he just posted an email that he got from somebody who was just fucking angry and basically like told me wanted to want him to die. Called him a whole bunch of things, you know, and talk about how shitty his game was, et cetera, et cetera. And his reply to this guy was, Oh, this was a hilarious April fool's joke. I like that. Was, that was <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was like, that's a, that was a, that's true. If you're going to do that to one day a year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, but again, but it's that same idea, right? Of just being like, trying to make a point about how fucking out of line a thing is. It's where, where in this case, line. it's just like, that was so absurd of a thing to do. You just be like this, has to be a joke yeah. because doing this for real is so fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> that I'm gonna I'm gonna take it as a joke because yeah. that's the you know, a bad joke. A bad joke with no punchline. No, but no. a joke nonetheless. Because then the idea is that, that that the person is the joke the whole time. This is yeah. this is actually one of the reasons why we don't really like Twitter that much is because it it's not a it doesn't let you build a cultural code. Yeah, it's like on our Discord. Our Discord is a self regulating community. People come into our Discord point. and they're like, I don't understand how like everybody in this community is just nice. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. there's just nice conversations happening. And my favorite part was like every so often someone does pop in and they either say something rude or they post just like a dumb meme or something. People and are like, people, get out. People stop it. Well, they don't think, <laughs> they don't think out here. They just say, oh, we don't do that here. Yeah. <laughs> and every time people are like, oh, okay. And then that's yeah. fine. Yeah. So and we actually, we, have this, we haven't had a lot of cases where we had to. No. Yeah. And our, well, our moderators are also really great for yes, thank like, you. Keep, keeping everything. That's true. They control. are kicking and banning people without us really knowing what's going yeah, on. But, so you uh, just see the, you but I mean, we, thing. and we have, so we have some rules that seem innocuous things like no memes, like no, don't cause, cause basically what happens when you have uh like this meme culture mm-hmm. is people stop talking to each other. Yep. They just don't talk yeah. to each other and they just post these pictures. Mm-hmm. They just post a picture and somebody else, then no response. Somebody else posts a picture. And all it is is you just expressing that you're part of a group, like that, you, that you're you in on the joke or whatever, yeah. you know. But there's no actual conversation happening. And then when that happens, you don't connect with the people around you and then you just don't mm-hmm. care about them, you know. Yeah. So I think it's all very weird. Uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing some stuff oh, yeah, go down. Just, yeah. As soon as the game comes out, there's going to be some nonsense. So. Uh-huh. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I'm just wondering what kind of uh, what kind of stuff we're gonna get get hit with for review bombs. What kind of interesting things is gonna happen? Well, well so probably because so the game's in early access, which which is good, right? Or will be. Um, but 
the fact like if we change anything, it might it'll change how people's levels feel or work or whatever else, or might invalidate some levels. And so, like you know, that people are going to get mad about that. We already know that going in. I think um, it's also the case that because we have a we have a lot of content in the game, um, but there's still some things that we're finalizing, and there are things that we have shown in previous trailers, even from quite a while ago, mm-hmm. that we're not going to have. Uh, ready just yet like uh, on the on yeah, the launch you still need some work i assume there's gonna be some people who see uh, yeah. on that yeah of course yeah i think that's all gonna be fine we'll see we'll <sighs> see all right let's get on to some questions these questions come from our listeners over at podcast.bscotch.net first question comes from Biggie Bapa boop have you ever actually put butterscotch into your coffee yes yeah actually because we, we have we all have. these we have all these worthers in here and yeah. so every once in a while i'll just throw it in just my dunk coffee. one in there that yeah. actually is pretty good yeah, it's pretty good yeah does a good job now, what you don't want is to put like butterscotch pudding in your coffee because no. that's actually or do you? Do you? You might. It might be very. Told good. you guys about the time I put coffee in my oatmeal, right? Yep. Don't do that. That's a <laughs> nope. That was one of those. But you did that on purpose, right? You're yeah. trying to like. Well, no, I thought I thought to myself, a super energized breakfast. Well, I was like, I like oatmeal. You know, that's good. Sure. I also like coffee, and I think the thing is that coffee isn't objectively good. You know, the like coffee yeah. is good because of the whole, like, it's caffeinated, yes, it's warm well, beverage, it's all these things. But it doesn't I, taste good. It, I like the taste of it. I, I think depending on what you do, you know, maybe if you, like, put a little bit of cream in there. Or whatever, yeah, yeah, but I mean, know. like, so because I agree, I also like the taste of coffee, right? But when I say I like the taste of coffee, I don't mean, like, I want coffee to flavor other things, you know? It's I like that like, you have coffee flavored ice cream. Well, yeah, like, I don't have good, those, those, are things. The, those are the smell of coffee. That's true. That's yeah. flavoring it. That's Not true. the taste, which is different. Yeah, so I well, I just I had to do it. I had to do the experiment. This was this was seven years ago, mm. though. Now maybe try it again. You know? So maybe my tastes have changed, but yeah. it was terrible. <laughs> it, was really bad. I, it probably also the the ratio probably matters a lot. You know, is it like is I it think oatmeal so. swimming in coffee? Is it just like a hint? You that's know, what's that's the, a good point. That's a yeah. good point. Because otherwise, I don't remember. I don't remember. Because if I it did. is just if you just used it as your water substitute, then basically what you're doing is you're is you're eating chunky coffee. Yeah, now, no, which wait, I'm not, now, I'm not, not a good that. description. Yeah. We did meet a, we did meet an inventor when we were in San Francisco who claimed to be working on a product that it that removes the bitterness from coffee and makes a cup of coffee that just tastes the way that coffee smells. Which means that my coffee habit is going to get out of control. Yeah, yeah. actually, maybe you shouldn't. Have, maybe this is not a good invention. Mm, you know, this is one of those. It's going to kill everybody. Yeah. We're all going to die. <laughs> Dude, he should maybe. Have, he, yeah, we might need to have him go. Maybe we just need to buy his patent and then mm, just burn just it. burn it. Yeah, it's getting too close to the eyes of God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't see it. Don't look at it. But I think if you did, if I had that, if I had that non-bitter, just like delicious coffee aroma beverage, oh, yeah. then I would put that in my in my uh, oatmeal. You might put it on everything. Put it on everything. Put mm. it in my cereal. Put it, put it in, I guess put it in your IV thing. bag. Put it in my IV bag. Put yeah. it you know, the one taste, that I you have. Taste it, yeah, your, your IV always. bag. You taste your blood all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Oh, because I've got it in like yeah. in my veins. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you can taste it because then the blood goes into your tongue. That actually is true. Too. When I was in the, doing chemo stuff, they give you all sorts of weird shots and you can taste them. I don't like that. No, I didn't I like it at all. <laughs> <laughs> none, none of them were tasty, which was the upset. Why like, don't they flavor them? I was like, hey, if you know this is going to hit me in the tongue. Why yeah. not? Well, I guess the question you know? is if they flavored it. And then shoot it in your veins, is that bad? But here's, they're they're so already you, you, shooting poison not, into your veins. Like, what, you know. That's if true. If put like, Kool-Aid we, in there. Yeah, yeah, put Kool-Aid in there. We're not going to put Kool-Aid in there. That's bad for you. Yeah. Right? <laughs> this is poison. It's literal poison. Give me some strawberry flavored poison at least. Fuck yeah. At least. And then it'll be fun, you know. Then you'd have a great time getting chemo. They'd be like, give me a shot of that. Yeah. Everything about chemo is great, except for the flavor. Yeah. You know, it's all real good. Yeah, you know, it's just a so, UX thing. It's a, U, it's, yeah. a, it's a UX design. Next question <laughs> comes from Retro Banana Man NL. Besides the five games that you have summoned upon this world and many jam games, did you guys do contract work? If so, mm. how did you acquire such tasks? We did not. We've been asked to do We've so. had some, some offers. We've had some opportunities a few times. Um, but we've got a we got a good enough sort of handle and vision on what we want to do with our studio in terms of making our own IP that never quite made sense. And we've had enough of a runway since Crashlands to not need to do it. So I think if we're ever in a position where we need to do it, then yeah, we'll probably do it. And the studios we've talked to, um, as long as you work with a good uh, you know, party who's who's wanting the game, it can be awesome because of yeah. course they're paying for you to build a game for once. You continue sharpening your skills. Well, you, gotta, and then, you gotta make sure that whatever contract you have is fucking good. rock solid yeah. because those relationships can be very they're usually not very good. Yes. And they can be particularly bad. Yeah. Uh so yeah. So 
I, 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 would I say, think we do have some some potential business partners that we mm-hmm. can have a good contract with. Yeah, definitely. And I think mainly we would only work with people who have contracted for other games before successfully. Yeah. So um, we can – And not burn those studios down as yes. a consequence. Yeah. So we can get some feedback about how that went. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of it is just like you know knowing knowing how games work is a – like they need to actually know a little bit. Yeah. Otherwise, they need to completely leave you alone that you do your job. Yeah. Which we, we also – do. We've had lots of randos tell us that we should make their app and then yes. split the revenue. Mm-hmm. So that's never going to happen. No, never. Also, you I should, can't if, if you're one of those people telling other developers to do that. Just, just stop doing it. that. <laughs> just don't. <laughs> well, I, I can never. I've I've never heard of a time, not even not even once, where somebody w- just went up to somebody and was like, "I have an idea for an app. If you make it, then we'll like split the ownership or whatever." That then that because no. there's a sequence of things that has to happen then, mm-hmm. right? Because then the, the person has to be like, "Yes, I have all the skills," and also. Tons of time and no, no ideas. ideas of my own. Mm-hmm. So I got, I got my, my calendar's open, right? Mm-hmm. So that has to happen first. Then the app has to succeed, which uh-huh. also never happens, yeah. right? Like, and then the whole time, the person who had the idea is, is what are they anything? doing? What are they doing? Because they're just like, I had the idea. Yeah. I'm out now. Now Your it's your idea problem. But since you can't own ideas in this context, then. Mm-hmm. Then the other thing that would have had to happen is like, let's say all the other things did come true. The developer was like, fuck yeah, that sounds awesome. I am going to go make that. Uh, then, then they go do all the work. Who's going to go cut in the idea guy and be mm-hmm. like, here's, here's half of all of my money after you thought of something. And then you I sat spent around three years of my <laughs> life yeah. building it. Yeah. And what we know best about so many of these uh, apps is that they often, they often come at a, uh, like on an accident in some cases, like somebody mm-hmm. stumbled across it, like while they were oftentimes developing something, something else. else. Like yeah. this is how Twitter appeared. This is how Instagram, Instagram appeared yeah. and all these things. Somebody somebody with the skill to do a thing is trying to solve an adjacent problem and then they stumble across something really cool and interesting, right? It's almost never the case that somebody with absolutely no concept of like how to program, how to do web dev, how to make an app or whatever uh, – somehow despite all of that has an idea that a developer wouldn't have had yeah. mm-hmm. and then makes it go that doesn't happen anyway uh <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. but we, we so we have we have gotten contacted for those contract things but it's only after we had already been making games for a while yeah. yeah so i would have no i would have no way to guess as to like if you wanted to start up a contract uh based game studio but you don't have a portfolio. I don't know how. Well, and honestly, I think if if that if the, if you're in that situation, if somebody comes up to you and and says they want you to do some contract work, you should probably say no because I think there's no way a possible good relationship could come out of somebody hiring somebody else who's never done the work before to do that. Like, because what position are you in as the as the contractor? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, if you're I like, think yeah, the, the important note is just to. Is it, if you want to get into that contract work thing, you need to already have a portfolio. Is what yes. it comes down to, and yes. then that so that will help work. you because you can't understand how much work certain aspects of a game take until you've built. That's some, true. Yeah, you can't estimate. Yeah, you no can't way to estimate, estimate your cost. Yes. No way to estimate. And so well, I think, I'm saying, like, so, so it would be a weird if somebody if somebody if some business came up to you and they're like, "Hey, you've never done this before. Um, we want to pay you to do it. Yeah, estimate how much that's going to." Like the, everything yeah. about that is completely crazy. So really you need to it. either have made some games of your own yeah. or, or have worked in that yeah, a contract house field too. for yeah. a while. Yeah. 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 That's a tough one. Well, and contract houses tend to have a lot of ebb and flow of, of work too. And so it's in general, it's probably uh, a little bit easier to get into those because they, oh, yeah, because they, they churn stuff out a lot faster because they need to. And they also, well, it's not hit pers- driven business those. Things. Right. Exactly. So it's like, it's going to be more, they've got reliable, yeah. more reliable income. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, all right. Next question comes from Sai. I'm in the middle of not the um, the Painting Korean uh, pop singer. Oh, but, okay, uh, that's too bad. I'm in the middle of devouring the podcast right now, and you guys have mentioned mechanical keyboards a couple times, but have never went into the details. I want some details. What switches? <laughs> Glorious Toper rubber domes, pre-built or customs? New model F group by keycaps, artisans, Ooh, LEDs, wow. QWERTY, Dvorak. Sai, you are on another level. Yeah, I would say we're not at that level. I got the clickety clack one. That's my. Bread it's butter. cherry MX red. That's the okay, switch. So that's I have I have blues. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, that's, I'm down with the whatever feels good for you. you well, Seth just got this new keyboard. I got a new one. It's a it's a Corsair K90 RGB 
platinum something, something. RGB just means it has colors in it. Yeah, it but colors. it's but it's more about the LED system than it is about the mechanicalness of the keyboard. Well, I the think. keyboard has to feel really good. It does, and, yeah. it, and it does. Uh, but that that keyboard, I downloaded a, an audio <laughs> visualizer which turns my keyboard into a sound equalizer visual thing. So <laughs> it like, actually has bars across because isn't if you look at a keyboard, it actually it's a grid. It's a grid, which means you can. Someone was like, oh. We could turn this into a bar graph. Could turn it into a visualizer, which yeah. means now it's a sound bar graph. Now while I'm now while I'm jamming to fat beats while programming, my keyboard's like, <laughs> and it's like shooting lights out and stuff, which is pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. It's yeah. the little things in life, you know. Yeah, but I mean, keyboards don't have. So you know, uh, like controllers have a have a rumble feature, right, to give you some sort of tactile ooh. feedback. And so do phones. So when you tap, you get a little keyboards rumble don't rip. have it because keyboards they sit on the that. desk and they would run away. You know, like maybe you have something maybe, vibrating while so it's sure. <laughs> But maybe you just, maybe you bolt it to the desk, you know, maybe you get some glue on there. I don't know. But, <laughs> so let's just assume you can it would just be find loud, a way probably. to stick it to the desk. Um, but just like something gentle. You what know, you would need bit. is it would need to simultaneously be attached to the desk, but also have some kind of dampening thing between it and the desk, you yeah, know, so because like rattle. Yeah. Have you ever put a controller or something down on a table? Oh, and it, goes, and like, it, yeah, it really yeah. makes a lot of noise. And then it runs off. And then it's gone off. now. <laughs> runs away. Uh, all right. So, I yeah, I mean, that. you just got to you got to investigate, find what works for you. Mm-hmm. Some people like the clicky switches where, yeah, you push them and they like they make an audible. Sort of, is it what we have? What we have? What's the cherry? One? The cherry MX red. They're they're just uh, you just press the key all the way down. And the, the clicking sound is actually the, the key itself hitting the the, <laughs> the aluminum backing of the board. Yeah, mine has the double the double click. So it's like you, you press it part way down, there's a click and that actually registers the keystroke, but you can still push it further. So that way right. if you just like if you want to fucking hammer those keys, you, you can just do get it in there. And it's fine. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to do like kind of a light touch, then it also works. Yeah. Yeah. I love uh, it. But I think people don't I was I was at the bank this weekend and I was looking at the the keyboards that they have there mm. and, and they're you're coming off your beautiful equal. Well, and there's these, <laughs> there's the, there and like they're on that keyboard the whole day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the thing I, I think people for some reason don't appreciate is that that's your tool. You know, yeah. that's your, if you're a mechanic, you've I got think your people tool don't belt. don't really know there are options. Yeah. I think that's totally yeah, true. I, I didn't know there were mechanical keyboards until we got them. I was yeah. like, what? I think people have heard of, you know, the, the ergonomic ones that are all fucking weird shaped, right? Mm-hmm. Like people have seen that, but they're probably looking there like, that seems weird. Yeah, that's but, yeah all they've ever shape. seen is sort of like maybe like the chiclet keys like you have on a laptop or maybe just like the $20 keyboards you get from Walmart or whatever that mm-hmm. are like, yep. that just kind of, when you push them down, it's kind of feels like, I mean, the key is going down. Mm-hmm. You got that going for you, yep. but there's no tactile, like satisfying sensation to it mm-hmm. or anything. But yeah, I mean, if if you're gonna invest in equipment, then get a, get a nice keyboard for it's yourself. Nice. Yeah, you know it's worth it, and they last for quite a long time. Like I replaced my most recent keyboard after like five years, mm. and I didn't need to. I just wanted a cooler one. <laughs> yeah. Like it was still it was still hanging in there just fine. I think they last like five million keystrokes or something like that. Wow. So you know, and you can also replace individual keys if you need to. So it's very fancy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and actually, yeah, we talked about how like taking your keyboard apart and cleaning it. It's like. It's just so satisfying. So like, you know? like you got all the keys laid out and you're in there with like a little Q-tip and you're like, yeah, just screw it. <laughs> Except it's disgusting in there every time. Yeah, but it's so much better when it's done <laughs> yeah. and you feel so good. All right, well, let's do one last quick question from My Secret Weapon. I've always thought that the only thing worse in programming than not knowing why something doesn't work is not knowing why something does work. Yes. Mm, yeah. Have you, yeah. Jeez. Have you ever had any instances worst. like this with Levelhead and how did it affect productivity? There's been a number of times where you realized after fixing something that you didn't know why. That it, it was probably that, yeah, based on my understanding, yeah. it shouldn't have been working. This, <laughs> this has happened on Rumpus a bunch of times, too. Yeah. 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 I'll go, like, I'll go in to fix something else and then see something. I'm like, what, what the fuck is that? And then go, <laughs> and, then go and then go like change it to be something that, that actually makes sense. And then, and then it doesn't work anymore. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. and then I got to go like fix it, but now in a way that does make sense. And then, yeah. It was actually your series of errors. Yeah, exactly. It was like some collection of errors that made it appear mm-hmm. to work anyway. Or appear to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't uh, remember yeah, specifically. But I do 100% agree with this question, which is yes, it's it very is way di- more disconcerting when that happens. I I think maybe because I'm coming from such a like a wild, wild programming background, <laughs> I'm weirdly more comfortable than I – way more comfortable than I should be with things that are working for unknown reasons. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> It's like anytime, anytime like sure and I are working through some of oh, his code and stuff too. Like the question I'm always asking him is like, explain to me exactly why this is, this is here. Like what exactly, what is this thing doing? Because yeah. to me, that's like, if you don't know what literally every single thing is doing, 
uh, then that's exactly how you get into trouble, right? Yeah. But the weird thing is when you – so if you, if you have that mindset, meaning that you code up everything and you know what it's doing supposedly, right? And you come back a month later and you look at that same thing again and you're like, that – right. That doesn't make sense. Like that, that doesn't, that is not appropriate. And but somehow, somehow it works. Somehow you were still getting the output you yeah. needed. Probably but, because whatever your inputs were, were just within whatever the parameters were yeah. that was fine. It was like some state in there that was acceptable and you just like, just hit it. I don't know. But yeah, that's, I don't like it. No. I don't like it. Do you remember all. any specific ones from Levelhead? Um, I know there's been a bunch. <laughs> it happens like every week or two. You're like, wait. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually that that's a much rarer thing now than it used to be because I'm true. becoming a, a better programmer. There are there are a lot of things that um, don't work very well, but work well enough given sort of the constraints of the game. So yeah. we've had we've had things like during the pre-alpha, uh, Kevin eight 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 from our Discord, mm -hmm. he was playing around with springs and he made a level that was just springs. It was Kevin or was it Nick? Uh, maybe it was Nick. I think it was Nick. It was, it was yeah. It was well, those guys were both breaking things all the time. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. yeah. Kevin was the one who made an empty level and saved it. And he, oh, yeah, game. he crashed Nick's the game the with that one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we have this level that's just springs, and one of the problems with springs is that they bounce off of each other, which means your collision checking has to be very like optimized for that to work. Because if you have a hundred springs, then each spring will have to presumably do a collision check against each of the other 99 springs which is 10,000 collision checks, mm -hmm. right? And of course, every additional one you add is a mul is multiplicative, right? It's like a, it's a squaring function. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have 200 springs and there's 40,000 checks instead of 10,000, et cetera, et cetera. So he made this level that was just springs and it was running at like one frame per second. And so I went to look at it and I was like, oh, probably because I'm doing these collisions in a really stupid way mm. that I don't, have to be doing, but I was right, and that were fine because in like the entire campaign, there's only ever maybe three springs on the screen at yeah. a time. Yeah, right. and you would never think like I'm going to fill a level with a hundred yeah. of these. As a designer, <laughs> as a designer, you don't make a level out of springs uh, because right? no, no offense to the creator, it's not fun. The level was pretty bad. <laughs> it wasn't it? Wasn't a very good level. Um, but w people should still be free to make a level like that if that's what they're. If that's that's what you're into. That's what you're into. Uh, so I I just quickly updated the collisions of that thing, and that all of a sudden brought his level up to like 30 or 40 frames per second, and all of a sudden it's totally playable. Then you can really experience just how bad it is kind of like <laughs> in real time, <laughs> uh -huh. fluidly, you know. Um, so like there's a lot of those kinds of things that happen, and I'm sure as like as level head gets more play, like as it comes out and stuff, we're going to see all kinds of stuff going on oh, yeah. that – that we had no idea people were going to do and it's going to expose all kinds well, of holes. Well, Crate had a similar problem because we saw people building machines where they'd be like using treadmills and stuff and then gravity to kind of drop, move around and drop crates. And uh, and so they, they were clearly a key mechanism to do that, but they were also so unoptimized that yeah. that created huge frame rate issues. Yeah. And, actually, and often they would just like go through each other. And, they would fall yeah. through each other. Yeah. yeah I think uh, so last weekend I just spent a few hours redoing how all the collisions work with the crates and how they handle like banging into things. And actually that caused me to redo the whole uh, movement system in the game and that gave us like a nine times speed boost yeah. on all mm -hmm. physics objects so you know things things work until you really stress test them and then yep. then they don't yeah so was that so yeah i guess this question comes out to two parts right one is premature optimization which is get the thing to work get that's, it to that's work goal number one uh and but but there's that there is that that other weird more sinister part which is when you look at a thing and it never should have worked period yeah, that's, that's the weirdest one. That's yeah. a big problem. And the reason, but we I, haven't had any of those. No, but the reason that, that if that ever happens to you, you should like really take a step back because that means that there was something, there's something fundamental that you do not understand about the programming language that you were using, mm -hmm. or about even the code that you wrote, or the code that you have, right? Yeah. And so, so every time it happens to me, which is which is very rare these days, but but when it does happen, like I, I treat that as a little in a literal emergency situation because that means that there's mm -hmm. some fundamental piece of knowledge about one of the two things, right? That is just missing. That if I don't shore that up, that's going to mean that this kind of thing gets to happen again, right? Uh, and that means you can have problems later on that you don't know how to fix. Yeah. That's the scary part. Yep. Because yeah. you'll go in because something will go wrong. Or you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that shouldn't have worked. And and now it doesn't finally, like as it was yeah, supposed to. Now you to, don't know what you've but built don't really know on what it, top yeah. of it. Yeah. Because especially if you, if you use one bug to treat another bug, then that's sort of a mm – -mm. Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, it's not a good time. Yeah.
All right. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. We'd like to thank our producers, Fat Bard and Jen Coster for uh, putting our podcast together. We'd also like to thank our community moderators who keep our discord running to get more involved in the butterscotch community. You can just go to podcast.bscotch.net where we have uh, merch for now. Uh, links to the community <laughs> discord. We got a way for you to donate to support the podcast and links to archives of all of our episodes. Thank you all for listening and we'll see you next week. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>